Hey class, this is the um, intro to the week three module for spring 2022 chilly day, um, chilly days in Texas. Hope everyone's safe. Now this week, I'm going to go into more detail about um, the Spanish in Texas during the 1700s. I just think it's really fascinating. I think it's important. And um, one of the things I keep banging home in this course is that uh, it's the legacy of Spanish Texas that really helps make Texas what it is today. Um, and I think it's easy to take that legacy for granted. But as I say in the podcast, think about every river, major river in Texas, except, except for the Red River, has a Spanish name, the Spanish language, the Roman Catholic Church, um, San Antonio, Goliad, Nacogdoches. Um, uh, the 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 uh, Mexican American population in San Antonio, and of course in 2023, uh, Latinos and Latinas come from more than just Mexico, come from Central America to San Antonio and, and South America. Although most um, Latinos uh, and Latinas in San Antonio still, their ancestors still hail from Mexico, and there are very close ties, of course, to this very day between San Antonio. Uh, and especially Mexico. So you really feel Spain in a place like San Antonio. You don't feel it that much in Houston or Austin or Dallas, uh, if you're from there. Uh, there are, certainly are par pockets of that, but uh, the Spanish legacy in San Antonio is everywhere, including the name uh, San Antonio. So I'm going to talk about the missions in a little bit more detail this week. I'm going to talk about uh, the rights of women in Spanish Texas, especially property owning rights, which is a very surprising story, as I'll um, talk about in greater length. Uh, women in Spanish Texas had far more property rights than women did in uh, British North America, just next door. Uh, really, there's no comparison. The other uh, aspect of this that I want to talk about that's a real legacy of Spanish Texas is ranching. Um, and of course, because of ranching, we have the rodeo as well. Uh, ranching, the ranching industry or the ranching business, maybe is a better word, was the dominant, dominant um, uh, economic activity of Spanish Texas. Now, once Anglos come into Texas in the 1820s, it's going to become cotton, but we're not there yet. We're still in the Spanish period of the 1700s. So the dominant economic activity in Spanish Texas uh, during the period that I'm talking about today is the ranching of cattle, uh, to a lesser extent, the ranching of horses, and also, um, uh, especially south of San Antonio, um, uh, sheep and goats as well. And what do you get from sheep and goats? Well, goats, you get Brito, but from sheep, sheep, of course, you get wool. So big picture, and this is something you'll be quizzed on, ranching um, is a big part of the story. And missions, the missions that I talked about um, last week, uh, they are very much central to the, ran the story of ranching in Texas uh, because they own the land where the ranches were for the most part. Um, at least until the 1780s when the missions were secularized. And I'll explain what secularized is in uh, the podcast. So I'm not going to get too much in the weeds um, uh, right here. But basically, they, they were standing on their own by the 1780s. And a couple of other things I'm posting today. Uh, I'm posting a kind of a, a dumb little uh, but fun little video on Tex-Mex food, which uh, is near and dear to the hearts, I think, of virtually everybody listening to this um, podcast. Uh, I guess you've, if you have some dietary restrictions, uh, Tex-Mex might not be the best thing for you. Uh, and maybe there's somebody out there that just doesn't like Tex-Mex. Although, well, my, you know what? My wife's not a big, huge, she's not a huge Tex-Mex fan. She's from Boston. Uh, but man, Tex-Mex, what could be better? Um, and the other uh, 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 little item I'm posting today, which I want you to listen to, is um, how Texas cattle, um, uh, the cattle drives, as I'll talk about in, in the podcast today, cattle drives from Texas started in the um, 
1700s, especially the late 1700s, as Texas cattle uh, were driven into Louisiana. So the first cattle drives actually started uh, during the Spanish period. And as you'll hear in this podcast, um, the first cattle drives were very much part of the Spanish effort to help um, the American revolutionaries as they're trying to uh, break from Great Britain. Basically, you had Texas cattle helping to feed uh, the uh, revolutionaries trying to create uh, an independent United States. And we don't think about uh, Texas and the American Revolution, uh, there's any uh, impact at all in, uh, from Texas in the American Revolution, but there was some impact. I wouldn't say it was a huge factor, but it is very interesting. And I think the bigger issue for me is it speaks to the cattle uh, business in Texas and how significant it was and how the first cattle drives start uh, during the Spanish period. Uh, I'll ask a couple of questions um on the on the podcast and on the little video uh, i post uh, in, in the next week's quiz in on the midterm i'm kind of getting the feeling that the this course may have gotten just a little bit too easy um you know i have a i have a kid who's a um a first year in college and i think maybe when i was writing my quiz question i was thinking of my kid <laughs> a little bit too much <laughs> and um but anyway uh i'm not 100 percent sure that that not every student uh is listening to the podcast and, and the other uh, material that i post so uh, i do want to um let you know that you will be quizzed um on what i post everything i post uh either on the uh quiz next week or um in anything i post you'll be you'll you'll be quizzed on and, and certainly on the midterm i don't quiz it i don't post it uh just to waste your time, I think it's significant. Um, for you students who are um, hardworking and do all the work and don't need to be scolded even in a mild way, I just wanna thank you. I actually think you're the majority of the students, probably the vast majority, but um, yeah, I'm gonna, it's gonna, I'm gonna tighten up a little bit uh, about making sure that folks are listening to the podcast and, and the other things that I post. Uh, I'm here to uh, help you learn. And um, I think it's kind of interesting, actually. And I, I try hard to make it interesting for you. So that's the, the material for today. And um, I hope you enjoy it. And you'll be quizzed on it next week. And stay safe. Um, I, the next couple of days, uh, I guess, especially tomorrow, I think UTSA is closed tomorrow uh, on uh, Wednesday. I'm recording this on Tuesday. Uh, everybody be safe out there. Um, icy roads are unbelievably dangerous and you, you often can't see the ice. So everybody stay safe um, and think about what it was like here um, in the 1700s when the, the Spanish were battling the various indigenous groups and trying to create the cattle industry and what it must have been like in Texas uh, in the 1700s. It must have been an amazing, but very, very remote place. Um, one last thing before I let you go. Don't forget that from the Spanish point of view, Texas is a headache. Uh, the Spanish were always trying from Mexico City, the, you know, the capital of, of New Spain. Uh, the government of Spain was always trying to consolidate and Texas was always trying to save money in Texas. Texas was just a big, big headache. From the Spanish point of view, there was no money up here. There's no mineral wealth. Sure, there was some ranching, but it wasn't, you know, it didn't really make a huge difference to uh, the folks in Mexico City. And uh, so keep that in mind uh, as you're listening to this. And, you know, we're so proud of Texas today and how dynamic Texas is and, you know, what a big part of the national and economic and international economy it is. But that just wasn't true uh, during the Spanish period. And because of that, although you have a long lasting Spanish legacy uh, in Texas, um, which I'll talk about uh, by 1820, when this 1821 really, when the Spanish are, are kicked out of North America, there's only about 5,000 uh, uh, people of European descent or have or European blood uh, uh, in Spanish Texas, which is incredible. That's That's like less than, the College of Liberal and Fine Arts at UTSA. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So um, the Spanish leave a, a, 
uh, a legacy in Texas that exists to this very day and that will always exist. But at the same time, by the time they, they left, they, they had very, very few people uh, in Texas. They'd settled very few people here. The indigenous uh, groups, especially the Comanche, still dominated Texas. Um, and this left will leave Texas right for the picking, uh, especially uh, when the U.S. becomes uh, its neighbor. Uh, 